Today we're going to take a look again at factoring. Um, I don't remember if the title I got onto your paper got fixed or not, but it should say polynomial expressions and not equations. If it says equations, draw a line through the word equations and write the word expressions. We are not working with equations today. Equations have equal signs. Everything that we do today will not. What that means is that there's no setting things equal to zero and solving. So we will stop a step short of what we've done in the past, okay? We're just getting it into the form where it has the parentheses factored and we're done, okay? So it will be a shorter process than solving equations, just factoring polynomials. Uh, to start with, we're gonna look at something that we have seen before called greatest common factor. Uh, greatest common factor is the largest factor that two or more terms have in common. So the first few that we're going to do are just going to look like terms given to us. They're not going to be actual expressions written out with like addition and subtraction between them, but just individual pieces that we're examining. So when we look at the first two that are given, we have 9n cubed and 15n squared. So as we're considering this, we want to consider both the big, biggest number value, right, coefficient that they have that they both divide by, and the <coughs> biggest variable piece that they both divide by. So the number of pieces here are 9 and 15. What is the largest number that will divide both 9 and 15? Five. Well, 5 won't divide both of them. Well, I meant like they're separated between 5. Like right. We want them in common. The largest one they have in common. 3. Yeah. So 3 is the largest value that they have in common that divides them both, right? So 3 would be the largest coefficient. And then the first one has n cubed, and the second one has n squared. So what that means is that there are three n's, as in n, n, n in the first one, and two n's, as in n, n in the second one. So how many n's do they have in common? Five. Well, two. Common means they both have them. Six. What do we think over here? Two. Tristan's right. There are two. So this is very much like having, let me write it out since I said it. I just didn't write it. Like so. So there are two n's that they share in common. So the greatest common factor for the variable component would be n squared. Does that make sense? Okay, looking for pieces they have in common. We're gonna do the same thing now, but with three terms. 14, seven, and six. What is the biggest coefficient that 14, seven, and six would be divisible by? All of them. One. Okay. I think we should probably write these out. We're struggling a bit. All right, so this is two and seven, right? This is just seven, or seven and one if you prefer. And then six is two and three. So if we put it into prime factors form, these are the prime factors. And there is not a single prime factor that they all have in them, right? Two is like almost... Uh, there, it's in two of them, and seven's like almost there, it's in two of them, but there's not one common to all three. So what that means is that the biggest number that they're divisible by, all of them, would be the number one. They always will be divisible by the number one. How about the variable components? So this one has two x's, this one has four x's, and the last one has three x's. How many x's do they have in common? Two. Two. Each of them have at least two x's in them. So the biggest variable component that they have in common would be x squared. And you really don't have to write the number one. If you leave it off, it would be the same thing. So if you write one x squared or simply write x squared, both of those would be correct, correct answers. How about 20 v to the fifth u squared w cubed and 5u x uh, squared w cubed. Let's do the numbers first. 20 and 5. What's the biggest thing they're both divisible by? Five. Yeah, 5. Good. Now, these have multiple variables in them, so we just take them one at a time and compare them. The first one has a v to the fifth, and the second one doesn't have a v, which means they don't have v's in common, right? And if you want, you can kind of mark them out as we've sort of talked about them so that we're not thinking about them again. The next piece, though, u squared, 
Well, u squared is actually identical in both pieces, right? So they have a u squared in common. They've got two u's in them, so that's u squared. So I've taken care of the u squareds. How about if I consider the w cubes? Same thing, right? They're identical between the two of them, so they have a w cubed in common. Right? There's three in one of them, and there's three in the other one, so they both have a w cubed in them. If one of them had said something different, we would have had to analyze them like we have the previous two problems and say, well, how many do they actually share in common? These shared them completely or not at all? So our largest common factor or greatest common factor on this one is 5u squared w cubed. Um, we can actually use this idea of greatest common factors now to factor expressions. We're going to start with binomials. So binomial just means it has two terms. So it has two pieces separated with addition or subtraction. So you'll notice all three of these are considered binomials because they are all just two pieces, either simple or complex, but they're two pieces separated with addition or subtraction. And we're going to do the same thing. So instead of just identifying the greatest common factor like we did here, right, we're going to use that to factor the expression. So we're going to start with the identification. We have 14 and we have 7w. What are 14 and 7w both divisible by? 7, right? They don't have any variables in common, but they do both divide by the number 7. So I'm going to factor that out like we did in previous sections, and we're going to ask ourselves the division question. What's 14 divided by 7? 2, and we write that at the beginning. And then there's a plus sign. The sign will stay the same because I'm not dividing by a negative. I'm just dividing by a positive 7. And what is 7w divided by 7? W. That would be w. And you can always check to make sure that you did it right. How could you check your work? Distributive property. Yeah, you could use the distributive property and just multiply it back out, right? So if you wanted to do a check step, whether either mentally or, or actually written out, we would actually multiply the 7 times the 2 plus w. And we'd say, yep, this is 14 plus 7w, and we could do a check step. I'm not asking you to do a check step, but it's not a bad idea to check your work anytime you're doing it, right? And make sure that you've not missed something along the way. It's easy to miss things. How about the next one, 9a and 13a cubed? Look at the numbers first, 9 and 13. Just one, right? 13 is prime, so it's just a one. How about the a's? Do you have A, do you have A squared, do you have A cubed, what do I have? A. Just A, right? So again, I'm asking the division question. If I have 9A and I divide it by A, what am I left with? 9. And then I've got the sign the same. I've got 13A cubed divided by A. What am I left with? 13. And how many A's? A squared. Remember, when we're dividing our variable components, we're removing that many a's, and we're left with the many, that, however many we don't have. I need an a squared here, so that when I take a squared times a, I get the a cubed. Okay? We're not dividing the coefficient or the exponents of the a's. We're dividing the a's out. All right, the last one's messy, just like number three was. Looking at, at it component-wise, right? So we'll start with the numbers, 3 and 18. 3. Now let's just go in order. I've got u to the 4th here next. So u to the 4th and u squared. U yeah, there's two, two, two u's that they have in common, so that's written as u squared. And then I have w to the 9th and I have w to the 6th. I have w to the 6th, right? It means I have 6 9's, I ha I'm sorry, 6 w's and 9 w's. There's 6 of them that they share. And I don't have any x's in the first piece, even though I have them in the second piece, so there's no x's that they share in common, right? Okay. So again, we can do this component-wise. I've got 3 divided by 3. That's a 1. If you want to write the 1, go for it. If you don't and you just want to leave it off, that's fine, too. I have u to the 4th divided by u squared. u to the 2nd. Right? I'm taking two u's out. There are still two u's written u squared still there w to the ninth, and I took out w to the sixth. 
How many W's are left? W to the third. And then I have my sign, which is addition. 18 divided by 3. 9. 6. Sorry, I just took what you just said. 6, thank you very much. We'll fix it. <laughs> uh, let's see, I have u squared. Take out the u squared. There's no more u's, right? We already took them all out. So I don't need to do anything with that. How about the w to the 6? Same thing. And I've got the x cubed left. So when I remove the variables, it very much feels like I'm just dragging a piece of it out and leaving whatever's left here, right? And it's the same thing for the coefficients, but it's easier to think of the coefficients in very much of a traditional division fashion and the exponents almost as a, as a moving fashion, though it's both correct. Any questions on that? Pay attention to the directions, right? These directions said factor, whereas these directions said just find the GCF, right? Just find the biggest one, greatest common factor. You don't need to do any factoring. Just pull the biggest one out and write it. So make sure and pay attention to the directions as they're given. Am I asked for the greatest common factor, or am I actually told to factor what I'm given? Okay? All right. I'm going to have a couple more. They're written a little differently. Okay, so these are the same directions, factor. And I want to consider everything in the first piece. I need a bigger stroke, just a sec. And everything in the second piece, the way they're written. So each of them have sort of a piece in front of the parentheses that I want to consider. And then they have a piece that's actually the parentheses that I want to consider. Looking at the piece in front of the parentheses, which here would be the 3y squared and the 2, do they share anything in common? No. The numbers don't share anything in common. There's not even a variable in the second one. So they're, they're the same. But what about the parentheses piece? It's identical, right? These two pieces are what they have in common. They both have a y minus 2. Is everybody good so far? Distributing this out is not going to be a good, a good approach to this. So don't do that. They share y minus 2, so we can pull out the y minus 2. And if I pull out the y minus 2 from the first piece, that means it's not there anymore, which means I'm left with 3y squared. And if I pull out the y minus 2 from the second piece, it's not there anymore, and I'm left with a 2. So do you see how it would be counterproductive to distribute everything and then refactor everything? It wouldn't be the best approach here. And in fact, you might find yourself in a position where you don't know what to do with the factoring. It's really ugly and messy. But on this one, it can be factored straight from the original problem because the parentheses pieces match. Now look at the next one. The same thing happens, right? So I have this parentheses piece in the first one, 2u minus 7, and in the second one, 2u minus 7. So I'm going to pull the 2u minus 7 to the front. And when I remove it from here, what am I left with? For you. Now what happens when I remove it from the second piece? What am I left with? Am I left with zero or am I left with one? Zero. I'm left with one. Let me show you why I need it to be one. Remember that check step I talked about a minute ago? Yes. If I check this and I distribute this back through, Distributing it through to the 4u gives me the original piece I started with here, right? 4u and 2u minus 7. And if I distribute it through to the 1, I will also get the piece 2u minus 7 at the end. But if I don't, I don't get anything at the end. And that's not what I had originally to start with. Another way to think about it is, oh, sorry, I was trying to delete that. No, it's still there. Let's undo that. Another way to think about it, I'll put the parentheses back, I promise, is that there's sort of an understood one here. Just like if you had the variable, say, x by itself, there's an understood one in front of it. So there is a one there. We don't typically write it, but it's there all the same. So if you want to think about it being written here that way, you can do that. 
All right. Why in the world would I show examples where I'm factoring out things that are in parentheses? That's a little weird. Well, the reason is because we're going to use something called factoring by grouping. Factoring by grouping is the process of grouping terms together using greatest common factors to break apart four or more terms into groups of two. It will result in identical binomial terms and allow us to completely factor. So factoring by grouping is typically used for groups of four, usually groups of four items. Okay? So let me show you an example with four items. The first one clearly has four items, agreed? Yes, definitely has four items. So factoring by grouping says I group them into groups of two, and you don't always know what groups will work. So I usually just try them where they are. Put the first two, put the last two, see what happens. If it doesn't work, we'll try another grouping. Maybe we do the first one and the last one, and the middle two. Maybe we do the first one and the third one, and then the second one and the fourth one. It matters, but you don't necessarily know which one to start with. So you usually just start with where they're located. The first group of two, w cubed and 3w squared. What is the greatest factor they have in common? Uh, w, squared. w squared, right? So we pull the w squared out, and we do the division steps we saw before. w cubed, pull out w squared, what am I left with? W. 3w squared, pull out w squared, what am I left with? 3. Three. From the next pair, 6w and 16, what do they both divide by? 6w and 16. I say 16? I meant 18, sorry. 6w and 18. And I'm hearing people, or seeing people say 6, right? 6 will divide them both, yeah. 6. So if I divide 6w by 6, what do I get? W. w. And if I divide 18 by 6, what do I get? 3. Three. This is the point when I'll know if the grouping I chose worked. If the parts in parentheses match, it worked. If the parts in parentheses don't, I need to try a different grouping. Do the parts in parentheses here match? Yes. They do. So my grouping worked. And now the problem looks just like the ones back over here. The groups in parentheses match. Here and here. So I pull them out in front. W plus 3 and I think about taking them out. If I take the w plus 3 out of the first one, I'm left with w squared. And if I take the w plus 3 out of the second one, I'm left with 6. And again, if you want to make sure that it worked, you can distribute and FOIL it all back out to check to make sure that you really do get w cubed plus 3w squared plus 6w plus 18. Okay, all good? Now this last example one, we've seen how to do it a different way. We've used trial and error, right? But I actually showed you as well how to use something called the AC method. You didn't really like it very much. Next class period, Monday or Tuesday, we'll actually see why the AC method is super valuable, okay? I promise. Um, but the, 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 um, the AC method is what I'm going to show you here because it does involve factoring by grouping. If you don't like the AC method still and you just want to use trial and error, you can. It's totally fine. I'm not going to count off for it. But the factoring by grouping is what shows up in the middle of the AC method. So if you remember what we did with the AC method is we said, okay, A times C. A is 1. It's the number in front of X squared. C is 12. B is 7. So 1 times 12 is 12. I need two numbers that multiply to be 12. And in this case, because it's all addition, right? These are all addition. They add to be 7. So what two numbers multiply to 12 and add to 7? 3 and 4. Three and four. Okay, all, all good with that? 3 and 4 multiply to 12, add to 7. So what we do is we take that 7x in the middle and we break it apart using the 3 and the 4. Instead of writing it as 7x, I'm going to write it as 3x 
and 4x in whichever order you want. If you choose 4x and 3x, it will be just fine. The factoring will work just fine. And plus 7, or 12, excuse me. And then here's the groupings. I now have four terms, and I can group it just like I did on the previous problem. I group the first two together. The beautiful thing about the AC method is that it really will always work as the first two and the last two. If you're given a problem like this previous one on number nine, it doesn't always work with the first two and the last two. Sometimes you have to change it up. X squared and 3X, what do they have in common? An X. If I take an X out of X squared, what am I left with? And if I take an x out of 3x, what am I left with? 3. three. And the sign stays the same. 4x and 12, what do they have in common? 4. four. So I take out a positive 4. 4x four divided by 4 is 3. three. I'm sorry, 3 is on a 12. x first, so 4x divided by the 4 is x. And then the 12 divided by the 4 you mentioned was the 3. Do the parentheses pieces match? Yes. Yes. So then we're on the right track. We put the parentheses piece down. That means I pulled it out of this piece and I pulled it out of this piece. So then I'm left with the x that comes before and the 4 that comes before. If you want to do this with trial and error, that's okay. So trial and error works too. Your instructions won't say you have to do it in a specific way, okay?